one of those. So this one is Out of Sight. Out, um, out of Mind, Out of Sight. Documentary by, about the inside of Brockville Psych. Um, documentary. So this one's a little bit longer. Um, about an hour. Uh, if I don't talk, I might add some stuff here and there. So thanks for watching. like a, a psychiatric unit at a general hospital where you would take your mother. Get out of the room! Get out of the room! Fuck you! I'm gonna hit you! I'm gonna hit you! I'm angry! Get out of the room! Get out of the room! Get out of Okay, she's yelling. Hang on, Justine just and Richard. Won't turn the radio down. Okay, come but with me. But he won't turn it. Just come with me to get. That's not going to help you. Come well, on. I'm fucking mad right now. Can we leave this he's room? He's telling me he's going to punch me. Can we leave? And he's this? telling me to leave. Justine. This room. What do you want me to do? He won't Justine. do anything. He's like, oh, he won't turn it down. Justine. He won't do anything. He's not telling me. You're to not turn it listening down. right now. You're yelling. You're yes, not I using am yelling, your rational. I'm very mad. You're not using your rational thinking. I need you to calm down. Walk with me so the guys can deal with him. Come with me. The Brockville Mental Health Center is strictly a forensic psychiatry unit, which means every client here has some sort of criminal charge. Well, then take it away from them! I can't. You need to not yell right now. You're yelling at me. Well, take it away. I've seen lots of violence over the years. Serious violence. We've had murders on this floor. The majority of people who have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, they don't have violent tendencies. But all our patients at some point displayed violence. They're stable, they're fine, but the potential for violence is what got them here in the first place, not just because they were schizophrenic, because they were violent. Michael's a very warm, intelligent young man struggling with a devastating illness, which is schizophrenia. We have been able to get him quite well, but never into recovery. Essentially, what's been going on with Michael is that he has become quite sensitive in social situations. It's not really paranoia in the sense that you think somebody's going to harm you. It goes back to, he has a feeling that people know what he did. As a new patient, generally speaking, they'll start you up on the fourth floor. It's like school. B4 South is grade one, 
B3 north is B2, or is grade two. Down here south is three, and what I'm on is four, and you want to get out of here. This is the most secure unit of the four in the FTU. They're pretty caged in for the, for the time being. They could come in on a serious crime. The staff wants to know if they're, if anything else, they don't want anything else to happen, anything else negative. They're strangers to each other too, so there's, there's a threat that exists between co-patients just as there's a threat between the staff and the patient, patients at times. So it's, it can be a hostile area. Have you got a blanket? Do you want a squeegee blanket? These are our most dangerous, most unpredictable fellows at this end. We're going to get some more guys up before we open that door. I don't think he even knows where he is no, at all. I don't think he knows what's even going on. Most of them are, are new people that we don't know that well and they haven't been stabilized on meds. That is very unpredictable. Very, very ill. Okay. It's just very sick. It could be very frightening if you weren't psychotic. Mm -hmm. And if you happen to come in and you're in for an assessment and you aren't floridly psychotic, I imagine it would be just a, a very frightening visit to the circus. Tell me about this program group. What are you taking? The one I just finished was called Symptom Management. Do they talk to you about if your voices return, how to handle that? Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. They ask you, does it sound like it's a person talking to you or does it sound like it's in your head? And you answer, no, I think it's the person talking to me or whatever. They ask you uh, what, what they say, the voices say. You tell them they say, I hate you, or I love you, or whatever they say, you know? Can you tell the difference when the voices are real and when they're not real? Well, I know my sister is here. I can, I can tell. I know my sister, sister's temper. You know your sister's and, here? And, and it scares me because I know she. She, she, she thinks I'm a loser. Okay, and... but is your sister here? No, she's not. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure. Okay. Do you see her anywhere around? No, but, but I hear hear her voice. Okay. I recognize but, it. So I, can you tell that those voices aren't real? No, you can't. That's when you need to come to staff. Okay. Okay. This is Germany. This, this isn't Germany. This is Brockville. Yes, it's Brock, Ontario, it's Canada. The pe people keep telling me it's Germany, what and people? I never studied. And what people? My sister. But your sister's not here. It feels like she's here. I know my sister's temper. My sister. My, my, my sister would get really, really angry at me. Like, That's all part of the voices that tell you things? Yeah. Now, those are not what they call command hallucinations. Command hallucinations are something different? Yes. What are they? Command hallucinations, from what I gather, are things that say, um, jump off this bridge. It's right there, look, look. There's the railing. <laughs> jump off this bridge. There's a bridge there, and it's quite quite elevated over the highway. And on the highway, there's huge huge vehicles passing, right? So you're walking across the bridge, and the voice will say, "Now's a good time. Now's a good time." So <laughs> the, that's what a command hallucination is, I think. What kind of thoughts are you having right now? I want to kill myself. I want to kill myself. Okay, Carol, <laughs> do you know us? Yeah, I know and, you. And we know you? Yeah, I know. And we know you, that you're a good person, right? Right. Okay. And and we're here to take care of you. Right. And we're here to keep you safe. I know that, so but that's, I don't feel love. Well, we're going to keep you safe, okay? 
Yeah. What I want to do is I'd like to help you with those thoughts because you're having really bad thoughts right now. Yeah. And those thoughts right now are telling you that you're a bad person, that you've done things, okay? Right. Which you haven't, right? They're talking about me on the TV. Those are the... And it, it's, it's over... They, that they hate me. Yeah. But people don't hate you here. You know, we've, we've treated you well and that you've done well. And that, I'm trying, my yeah. best friend. It's been like a You're month just, since you know I've been Carol? 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 You're just having a bad day, right? Everybody's. Listen, everybody's allowed to have a bad day. It's okay. I know, but only one. No, it's okay. to say here um seeing the history in places like willowbrook um and then seeing this actually gives me hope for an improvement in mental health care over the years um and the evolution of it to go from what it was to this to whatever it will become just seems powerful to me and i also like here in this documentary how they're using personal cases because i think that really gets it to hit home more for public watching it so thanks for watching hey mike hey peter how are you not too bad you good to see you i'm good it's you thanks okay. johnny Looks like you got some sun. More than me. Maybe. How you doing? The name uh, of this person right. is Michael Roland Stewart. His date of birth is December 14th, 1978. His date of admission was March 22nd, 2005. His index offense is second degree murder. Legal status is not criminally responsible, NCR. Mike belonged to what would normally be considered the popular crowd. He was extremely self-assured, extremely confident, and um, top marks in the class. Lots of friends, girls and guys. He's probably among the funnier sure. people in the room, I think. But he was very, just so sharp, such a good way with words, you know, supremely confident. And this was certainly into the time where Mike had become sick. Spring of 1997. There seemed to be a difference in him right away, and I thought that he kind of became quite recluse. He thought mom had awoken him so she could read his mind a few hours before he went to school. Do you see a big change in him today? Oh, he's not the same guy at all. From a nursing perspective, Mike is making slow, steady improvement, but some negative symptoms remain. His overall mood is good, but quiet. He spends a lot of his leisure time in the TV lounge, but does not socialize much with co-patients. He's always struggle with the social aspect of the hospital so he he seems to do better with staff to hang around with his peers I don't think he's he's ever been very good at that he has become quite sensitive in social situations he for example has turned down the opportunity to go into the community on his own. We were talking, uh, Mike, about, uh, you know, not right now, but looking down the road maybe in a few months or that, possible uh, community placement options. 
Now, we're lucky with your disposition that we have all options open. You know, anywhere from group home to independent living to co-op. Is that something you'd be ready for in the next couple of months, do you think? Well, I, I don't... I, 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 I just like to... Well, it's hard to say. I, 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 uh, I... How about, you know what, in a couple weeks, we go out and look at the co-ops. A couple weeks? Yeah. Just look. Not to move in, nothing like that. Or if you want, we could do it next month. I'll well, get a no, car. I, I just, I don't know why we, we're going so quick. The next person we're going to conference today is uh, Carol. Then this is the upstream. Carol is a 39 year old female. This is what I call my imaginary friend. Carol was found in CR on account of mental disorder on two charges of assaulting a police officer and four charges of assault on September 20th, 2010. Head up. From what I understand from her past, she would become very upset. She'd run into traffic. Oops. When you work, you gotta get up early, get showered, have to look appropriate for your job, you know, a dress in your best. An act team worker came to visit. She didn't want the act team worker to leave. And she threatened to commit suicide, is my understanding. And as the act team worker was leaving, she jumped off a balcony. And that's how she uh, got a lot of the orthopedic injuries that you see when she walks. Can you give me a sense of how many of the patients here are capable of serious violence? Absolutely all of them. Every one? Every single one. Every single one. Carol Seguin? Oh, yes. Oh. Absolutely. Carol is one of those people that there is no question. Once she, once she started point, to yeah. be a problem, you had to get out the five-point yeah. restraints because if she couldn't get at you to hurt you, she would start smashing her skull on the wall. And you know within a few minutes of locking her, she's going to start whacking her head off the toilet or the usually the cement walls. You had to, you couldn't listen to that. It was just awful. The sticker is our for good behavior, and it tells you that if you get 14 stickers in a row without missing one, you get the order out, or you can save your money for whatever you wish to buy. And if you don't, if you, I miss one, I'll take a couple here so I don't get one. But here, I had a perfect month, and over, over here, I had a perfect month. So when you say bad behavior, what do you mean by that? Yelling at staff or refusing to take my pills or refusing to go to my room when I'm, when I'm upset or getting into a fight with people, getting to into an argument, I don't get a sticker. And are, are you a bad girl often? Yeah. <laughs> That's hard for me to get a whole month of stickers. Bad behavior gets me in trouble. I find it hard to be good. You find it hard to be good? Yeah. And how are you doing so far this month? Uh, well, I'm off to a rocky start. <laughs> Awful females. They're the worst. I'm sorry, they are. I didn't say that. <laughs> They're just, of course you didn't. <laughs> I jumped on it. <laughs> <laughs> Women make the worst patients. Oh, absolutely. And it's just, oh, absolutely. I, I agree. There, there is no explaining how or why. It's just that way. <laughs> just another day in the neighborhood. 59 patients here at the forensic treatment unit and about five female patients is quite a difference. The men are quieter. 
Michael is in for murder. And Carol is in for minor assaults. The men tend to cause more violent crimes on the outside, in the outside world. And the women tend to cause more violence on the inside. I wonder if that fact is still true today as far as how we institutionalize and if that is true, like at Acadia National Hospital here in Bangor, Maine. Um, from my time experience, um, I notice this tends to be true, but it's also because the women are more likely to reach out, whereas the men have been taught that they don't show emotion, so they're less likely to reach out when they're having trouble and just do something. So. She was the most challenging patient by far, uh, considered by all the staff. The room number. Yeah. Hey, Nancy. Yeah. These have been in for a week. Do you think you can take them out? Which one's that one? These ones. They've been in for eight days. They're only supposed to be in for a week. Well, frankly, we're quite concerned about her and her recent uh, self-harm attempts. Um, she would come to us and say she really doesn't feel well. We'll ask her, again, well, well, you don't feel well. She feels like cutting herself. She's told us she, she craves this. It's like an addiction, and she just had a, has to satisfy this. And she'll keep wanting to do it until she actually does it. We've had four different cutting episodes, quite uh, deep uh, gashes on the arm. Boy, you sure, you sure hurt yourself, eh? I didn't do it as deep this time. Mm -hmm. That one was a bad one. Wow. Lots of stitches there. Mm -hmm. And why do you think you do that? Mm -hmm. mm. Feels good sometimes. We were also really concerned about a uh, recent incident where she'd torn up a face cloth and tied it together to make herself a ligature. Tied it tightly around her neck and tried to strangle herself. She was, when staff found her on the floor in the shower room, she was, she was blue. We brought a noose cutter to that area and they used it to cut the ligature off her neck. After that, was removed, the color started to return to her face, and she started to respond. So we just thought it was a close call. Then we're always watching for the next time. It was mostly because when you tie a string around your neck, you get uh, really dizzy, and uh, the feeling of being passed out f feels good. It's like a, almost like a high. And that's what I was looking for, is that, that feeling that you get when you almost die. I, I like that feeling. We did save her life. We did save her life. Yeah. You know, we know that it's all a matter of time with these strangulation attempts and so on. Sometimes it's just in a matter of time if we save them or not. Lunch is now on the ward for the south side. Lunch is now on the ward.
are you doing? Hi, Mike. Hey, well, how are you? Doing? How are you doing? Not bad. Steve, Michael, haircut. Yeah. Looking good. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. Doing okay. Yeah. Yeah. Want to dip in? Go for it. When's the last time you had muscles, Michael? The last time I had muscles? Mm hmm. Jeez, I don't. I don't remember. Really? Two RCMP pulled up and uh, asked us, is one of you Rebecca Stewart? I thought that Michael had, had killed himself because again, that was always the, the concern. And he just said to call your dad. Dad picked up and said, hello. I said, hello. I said, what's going on? He said, something very bad has happened. Um, and I said, Michael's killed himself. And he said, no, uh, Michael has killed your mother. And then I was caught off guard. And I said, no, and he said, yes. And then I think I said, no, again. And I was worked up, so I asked if I could call him back in a few minutes, get off the phone and call him back. He said I could do so, and then we hung up, and then I just started smashing the receiver, the phone receiver into the phone and kind of realized that I was in a public spot. So I went outside and just went for a little walk. And that was it. That's always good. Oh, you look very unhappy. <laughs> He apparently arrived at his parents' home in the early afternoon and waited in the house until his mother, the victim, arrived home between 3.30 and 3.45 p.m. He was reported to have confronted his mother and then an altercation developed between the two. She eventually died from severe blunt trauma to the head. She was uh, a nurse who uh, loved her profession and uh, a community uh, member who loved her community and a mother who loved her family. Tommy Donahue's farm up in Douglas, Ontario. As you can see, well, it's Friday morning, September the 7th, the year 2001, and the sun has just come up, and you can see the mist through the uh, rail fencing and, of course, the cattle. So, what a perfect day. in that picture. Mm -hmm. It's a cute photo. We're dressed for an, an evening out. Pretty loud outfit. And our mum's for it. Which yeah. is typical. Fairly standard, yeah. She was a fashionista mm -hmm. in her own right, I think. She liked to dress up. I don't think I've ever I've, seen that I've picture. I've never seen that either. It's beautiful. It's a photograph of mum I've not seen before. And it's, it's nice. It's a great picture. It looks pretty pensive. What had Mike's relationship with her been like before? She loved him very much, and, uh, and he loved her very much, too. And I think that uh, where he needed very occasional emotional support, he, he got it in spades from her. You know, a mother who, for years after Michael became sick, would cry herself to sleep at a concern for him, and he knew that when he was well enough to know that.
I remember when she came here in 2005, she was like a wild animal. And she was in five point restraints because she was so wild and out of control. And in two years, she was stabilized and she was the best that we could possibly do with her. Her risk was low enough to get her back out in the community. And we had high hopes for her. I really miss you. We're gonna go. What happened to you? Oh, how are you? I'll tell you, I've seen Carol at her best, and if she's encouraged, it's very encouraging for me and the other staff to see how she does. I'm good. Oh, are you okay? I'm good. Hey, Carol. Hey. She can be kind. She can come up and give you compliments. <laughs> but on the flip side of that, 10 minutes later, she'll come up and call you a cocksucker and say she hopes that your kids die and she hopes that, you know, you crash your car on the way home. I remember one morning she came up to me. It was about 5 o'clock in the morning. And she called me a cocksucker and hated me. And she was kicking out the door and punching out the door. And as she walked away, she said, uh, you raped me. You raped me. You came into my room at night and raped me. So I reported that, documented it. And I thought that it might not go any further than that. But it did. Well, what I heard is you went running down the hallways yelling, rape, rape, he raped me. And... I said that? That's what I heard. I didn't say that, though. Okay. Well, that, that's what I had heard. And with the way things are in society, it can really put staff, especially male staff, in a really difficult position. No, I never said yeah. that. Okay. I think you heard wrong. Maybe okay. I said something different, but I didn't say that. Okay. Well, I'll look back in the, in the chart as well, but that's oh, what I heard. Oh, you could have heard somebody else's voice. It sounded like me. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I never said he raped me. Okay. Never. I swear to God, I almost okay. got to shake your hand on it. Okay. <laughs> Do you ever come down here aside from visits, Mike? Um, not really. Following this attack on the mother, Mr. Stewart then called 911 at about 4.05 p.m. He was found in the house when the police arrived. He was then arrested, escorted out of the house, and transported to the Renfrew OPP office. He remains reluctant to discuss this in detail as he reports that he finds the whole incident difficult to discuss at this time. Do you ever talk with family about what happened? We talk about other things. Yeah, it's the hypersensitivity to social situations. So he stays with staff. He's worried about going into the community because he thinks people know who he is and what happened. How do we get him past that? How do we yeah. get him? Who do we have in our team that can get him? I don't think he wants to talk about it. I mean, you got to be. I don't want to stir up something that's you know that's not going to. You know, I mean, I think for the moment it's. I think just let's leave it and see where he goes with it. We're going. Okay. Okay, I'm ready to make a confession. And that confession is that I, uh, I kind of, kind of lied when I said that I that that Margaret that I didn't say that Margaret that Margaret raped me because I did say that Margaret raped me. But I didn't remember having had said that. 
Did Mr. Earl ever touch you inappropriately or rape you? No. It was all in my mind. It was voices. Mm -hmm. I do believe that the, that the female patients here do cause more turmoil. They can be quite aggressive in their acting out, banging on walls, actually putting holes in walls too. It's, it's incredible to imagine that, that a female patient could do that, but it really does happen. Who did that? That would be Carol. <laughs> I use the palm of my, the ball of my hand to smuck right into the wall. And I want like that uh, force until I enter a um, pencil hole about that deep. And that went into a wall. And people were, were a little bit scared of me. This is hole number one. Hole number two. And hole number three. And hole number four. Did you injure yourself? No. Your hand didn't hurt after punching four holes? It stung a bit, but uh, I didn't hurt myself. I didn't cut myself or anything. Have you ever seriously injured anybody? Not seriously, no. What's the, what's the worst that you've done in your face? It gives them a black eye. That's the worst physical injury you've inflicted on anybody? Yes. Absolutely. I think he suffers every day from the loss of his life, the life that he could have had. And I, uh, he doesn't speak of it much, but he has spoken of it from time to time. So, so uh, I've made strides, but I, I want to make it so I'm, I can, I can like hold down a, a, a start with hold down some kind of a job, and then. See, see, if, see if I can uh, try to salvage something here of my life because I'm, uh, I'm a little old for uh, college or university. How old are you? I'm 33 years old. So that leaves me with a def another option, right? I can get work. Now, I think for someone with my limited qualifications, it might have to be in something like retail to start. I know that it's there with him. He would like to have a life. How did it start with you in South? I, I, I was attracted to him at first. That he was a good looking, handsome guy and that he was a gentleman. I, I didn't know him very well, but he would go like that, put my, put my hair, put my hair over my, over my ear like that. He'd go like that, sort of mess up my hair. And then he asked me if I wanted to go out with him. What about girls? You had a young a relationship with a young lady here? I'm a half so had a relationship with her. Mm -hmm. That's Carol. Carol. Mm -hmm. The female patients here. All of them just want to be an ordinary woman. May I kiss? Thank you. <laughs> they still want to get married and, and have children and have a house and they have the same dreams and aspirations and for some reason, they're all of a sudden put into this position where everything stops, their whole life and their, their dreams change. Sun's shining today, my baby's looking at me, 
And I'm looking at him right now, making him smile. But this song I made up, so don't get me wrong. I know my own song. If you know what I mean, you're the one for me. He knows who I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, music is a wonderful thing. You know, it's just a form of expression. Anyways, I'm going in, it's too cold. One day he just said, I'm ready, and I want to go into the community, and that then gave us the, the reason to go ahead. I have recently got the privilege where I can go into the community unescorted, but I have to fill out an itinerary. Right, there you okay, are. thank you. Detailing where I'm going, what streets I'm taking, uh, and the different times I'll be at the different landmarks. It's supposed to be down, almost down to the minute. Right, there you go, bud. Okay, thanks, Bob. All right, we'll see you in a bit. Yep. Yeah. My favorite river. His name is Sam. Sam. I named him that. So I always want to wonder, boy, and my boy died at birth. So I thought uh, if they gave me a little teddy bear, and maybe it would take the pain away. So he's been, a, even though he's not real, he still helped me. I still snuggle him and go and hug him and kiss him. Like he was an actual boy. It's like the Pinocchio story, the boy becomes real. The wooden doll becomes a, a real, little, real little boy because he stops, to, uh, he learns to stop lying. <clears throat> And the boy that the 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 one that had Pinocchio as a as like a dog friend always believed that he was real, and he uh, he did become real in the end. But I don't know. He'll never become real. But he's still my baby. <laughs> People suffering from schizophrenia and major depression with psychosis kill family members. Once they recover, they then realize that they've done this terrible, terrible thing. He still hasn't forgiven himself. I mean, I see him every week or two. I struggle with he knows intellectually that he was mentally ill at the time. He has never, ever forgiven himself. It compounds his, his sorrow when he knows that we've lost our mom uh, at his hands as well. One can only imagine the horror that he experiences in those moments when he allows himself to recall that day. 
And I don't know what would be worse, whether the days when he's perfectly lucid are, are more painful for him to, to endure or the days when he's, when he's not well. But uh, I, I can only imagine that it's a, it's a living hell every single day, and uh, some days are worse than others. Let me just ask you before we continue, are you okay? Um, I think I'm fine, yeah. Okay, well, you, you'll say so. If you need to stop, if you want to stop it, it's okay. It's cool, man. Okay. Okay? Okay. Um, it was foggy in the beginning. Um, I, uh... I had trouble accepting my, uh, my, uh, diagnosis, and, uh, uh I, at, there was a time when, uh, I, I had, uh, things were all well with basically anyone that I knew, I, I, I didn't really have enemies, and then, um, and I never really, so I didn't have any enemies, so why, why would I, why would I do something like this to someone that, that, uh, I, it's, 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 uh, like, right after, like the, we're talking days. I was I was calling them and asking for forgiveness. Days. Like it would it'd be weird because like, um. I would if I if I was feeling particularly bad, I would call my dad or my sister or something like that. And uh, and I would say, I would just say, oh, I'm feeling horrible. There there'd be no there'd be no. There'd be no line, like uh, sense to the conversation. It'd be just me saying, I'm sorry, you know, you... Forgiveness, forgiveness and trust are such slow um, things to earn that uh, it's like, uh, I, I, I wanted, like I was, I wanted to make sure like I just wanted to call them and make sure that they would. Uh, well, I was I was fearful that I would be abandoned, you know. So. You all love and support Michael. Unreservedly. Definitely. Mm hmm. But but but, uh, and now it's turned to the fact that that I've come to realize that uh, my immediate family are, are my, uh, they're, for, for some unknown reason, they've stuck by me, so. The question of how we could forgive um, someone like Michael is, is, a, is a classic example of blaming the victim. Seems like such an obvious analogy, but you don't forgive someone for contracting their cancer. M Mom, unfortunately, lost her life. Um, but it's important to, to keep in mind that, that there are two victims in this story. And one of them happens to still be suffering. Um, um, Michael survived the... Um, the, the terrible event, um, but he, he continues to suffer. It seemed like the, 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 the positive memories and the negative memories both caused me pain. Because look, look, what, I, look what I've done. It's, I, I've, not, I've impacted so many like, 
I've impacted this network of people. I think that in at the loss of, with with the loss with the loss of a loved one, um, uh, with an with an act of unthinkable violence such as this, we our instinct is to is to look for look for the fault, look for the cause of it. Um, but we make a, a terrible mistake to think that that cause rests with Michael himself. Um, the, the cause of this tragedy is a, is a mental disease. It's a mistake to, to say that Michael was himself her killer. I mean, her killer was schizophrenia. The cause of her death was this disease. I, I'm not able to grieve the way I'd like to. I have a, I have a, I have some grief but it's not, uh, it's not, uh, uh, a feel good grief, which I imagine, uh, cause I, I, from what I know, I, I've, from what I know, some people grieve, gr grieve loved ones with fond memories. <laughs> Whereas I'm not. I'll just say this. this is, I'm grieving like, like it's like if I grieve, I kind of, unless, there are odd moments that contradict this, or not odd, but spare, occasional moments that contradict this, but for the most part, I grieve alone. Carol, I understand you have a big surprise for us today. <laughs> yeah, well, I got new teeth, tops and bottoms. Wow, wow, that looks really great. Thank you. Congratulations. I feel like a million bucks. Can you take them with? <laughs> Miss Wright, what big teeth you have. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Oh, very good. Have people noticed? Oh, yeah, everyone's noticed. What are they saying to you? They're saying I look great. There's your little tiny little piece of that. There's a little piece of that. There's a little Oh, <laughs> don't don't share that in well, here. Well, the one that kills you when you're a slob. Jill, what's the one that kills? I guess the bottom line is I'm out of the hospital, so I'm I'm I'm, I'm quite happy that that uh, I've got this far and. This is my uh, my apartment. I'm living here with another guy, and uh, it's I'm still getting used to it, but it's that's where I'm standing now. From two or three days after I got here, I'm I'm happy I made the step. So you've made strides and in, initial strides to, you know, to get out here in the community and make a life here in Brockville. For sure, it's uh, 
Like I, I, I try to, I try to keep busy. Well, what's your your diagnosis of schizophrenia? Um, <laughs> or just plain think, nuts? <laughs> no, no. I, and now that I'm here, it's it's like I. Uh, at some point, I'm starting to get optimistic about um, maybe uh, at one point getting making it further steps. But I, the idea is to kind of take it take it uh, somewhat slowly. What what medication do you take? Yeah, I take uh, I take twice a day. I take medication, right? Yeah, and you find it helps. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Otherwise, you'd be pretty goofy. I feel. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.